I'm Reverend Kim Polchow from Marshfield United Methodist Church. Welcome back to Having Men for Dinner. This is episode one, part two. Let's get into the story of Judith. Did that story seem familiar at all to you? That's from the book of Judith. And I told you the story pretty much as it lies, some modernization of language, her her song, the words dead drunk, and even the idea that she would laugh at him if he didn't try to seduce her, those are straight from scripture. Yet you've likely never heard this story in church. It's only considered scripture for some people. It doesn't appear in most Protestant Bibles, although it does appear in Catholic Bibles. Uh, Catholics and Anglicans consider Judith part of the Deuterocanon, or second canon. The books we all share are considered the first canon. These books have been called the Apocrypha or hidden writings since the Middle Ages. Martin Luther kept these writings in the Bible he produced in 1534, but he set them apart as a separate section. You can find study Bibles out there that include the Apocrypha today, and it's generally placed between the Old and the New Testament or the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, because they were written between those two testaments in the time period between those two testaments. So some of you may have read, studied, or heard the story of Judith before today. And for others, it may seem familiar because it shares some similarities with stories in the Hebrew scriptures, or maybe it's not familiar to you at all. And that's cool too. I started with Judith because it is the least familiar of these similar stories, because it has the most detail, and because uh, probably no one will get upset when I say the following things. Judith is a fictional story, meant to be recognized as a fictional story. Early in the text, the Jewish author does what Jewish authors did to signify that this is just a story, if there's such a thing. The author put in serious anachronisms or things that would make it obvious to those who know their biblical history that this story takes place in an imaginary place on an imaginary timeline. In other words, the story is purposefully a historical, and the author left us clues to understand and recognize it's a historicity. For the modern reader, though, those clues might be a little bit easy to miss. So the the details aren't super important to our uh, discussion. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I'm going to tell you what some of those clues are. So the first one is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Assyria in the story. That's a familiar name to students of the Bible. Uh, We read it a few weeks ago in church when we were studying Daniel Nebuchadnezzar was not the king of Assyria. He was the king of Babylon, and that's why we know him in Daniel. The king of Assyria in the Bible had names like Shalmaneser, Tilgath, Pilasar, Sargon, Sennacherib. You may have heard those names. Those are Assyrian kings. So to the early readers of this book, reading the words Nebuchadnezzar, king of Assyria, would have been their very first clue that something was off. It's a, it's a trick in a way. The second clue is that the scale of everything in this story is epic. The armies are massive. The livestock wear sackcloth and ashes. These kinds of uh, hyperbole or massive exaggeration usually indicated to early readers that these were not meant to be understood as factual details. They're simply weren't all that many people at the time this happened to make this story like in the area for this story to even be reasonable. Clue number three, there ain't no such town as Bethulia. There is no other mention of a town named Bethulia in the Bible or in any historical record. There wasn't a town that was just a straight gateway into Jerusalem. Furthermore, Bethulia means virginity in Hebrew which basically sets it up as an allegory for the purity of Jerusalem threatened by the onslaught of an invading army. This would have been early readers' third clue that this story was fictional. A town called Virginity? 
But before we even think of dismissing the story of Judith as just a story, if there is such a thing, let me just say that um, this story is very important for several reasons. Number one, it is one of the very first examples in the world of what we now call historical fiction. Number two, it is a rare story about Jewish womanhood. The story references other stories about women in the Bible, including the story of Jael, which we will get to, and the story of the rape of Dinah. And, and besides that, it's just a down, downright a girl power story. Those are kind of rare, at least in the Bible. Number three, it follows a pattern set by other Bible stories. So we'll we'll come back to this in and out of this, but um, I've used Nicole Wilkinson Duran's book to teach uh, this study before. I, I used it several times ago when I taught this. So, but I really like the five points that she says that the stories of women murderers of the Bible have in common. So we'll go over these quickly. First of all, every one of these stories has a powerful male enemy, a foreign male enemy. So you've got to have a guy that has power and is foreign. We have that. That's uh, that's all of our names. Second, you have a particular situation with the husband. The husband's not just in the other room. Like the husband's, there's something up with the husband. So in Judith's story, of course, the husband died oddly of heat stroke, which you think would be something. I don't, I don't I'm not, I'm not going to have any comment on that. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments to myself. How's that? Third, you have to have some sort of sexual tension, which is pretty obvious in this story because Holofernes decides that Judith is going to mock him for not trying to rape her. That's so messed up. And four, you have food or drink as hospitality. So you have to have in these stories of murdering women, or at least all of them do have women providing some kind of hospitality in the form of food and drink. And she, of course, carries her food in a, and drink in a bag. There's a big point made of that. And then also he ends up dying while he's, you know, dead drunk. And then last, there's a cold-blooded murder by a woman. So th- those are the elements described by Nicole Wilkinson Duran, a professor and pastor uh, who seems to have been the first person to connect these women murderer stories Um, and a couple others that we're not going to cover in her book, Having Men for Dinner, Biblical Women's Deadly Banquets. So the fourth reason the story of Judith is incredibly important has to do with the name of the story and the heroine. You know, it's interesting that Bethulia means virginity and represents the purity of Israel threatened by an invader. What is even more interesting to me is the name of our heroine. Judith is a name we're familiar with because it's used in modern times. The meaning, though, is right in front of our noses. So what country is she from? She's from Judah. Judith is the feminine form of Judah. So it could mean woman of Judah, but it's actually even more interesting than that. When Israel and Judah split back into two kingdoms after the death of Solomon, Judah was the name of the southern kingdom. Israel in the north fell to the Assyrians and basically disappeared at that point. Judah remained. A Judahite, a person of Judah, got a different name we are more familiar with from the Bible, but from the New Testament. They began to be called Judeans, right? And Scripture tells us Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. So Judean is the next form of the word Judahite. And our modern form of the word that describes the religion that came out of Judea is Judaism. And the people and the people of the religion and race are called Jewish. So Judith means quite literally Jewess or Jewish woman which means that she was written as a prototype of Jewish womanhood. Her name was not Marge or Sandy or Sylvia or Mary. It was Judith for a reason. It was Judith because this story was written to show us what a good Jewish woman will do. Defy what is expected of her to do what needs to be done. That is powerful stuff. And if you find yourself surprised, 
that a woman who committed an act of violence is being praised and lauded for it, consider this. There's a lot of violence in the Bible. Then, as now, there was a lot of violence in the world. We have to be careful how we judge these women. We'll come back to that in future stories, particularly in the story of Jael. So Judith is the epitome of Jewish womanhood, and scholars believe this story was likely written to describe the actions of a powerful Jewish woman from history, someone we've probably never heard of before. And in the next part, part three of Judith, I will tell you where the idea of Judith may have come from.